Next on Granada TV, a programme from the series Comic Timing, entitled Arthur Smith Sings Andy Williams. And I'm particularly delighted to announce this next show, because I'm actually in it. If it goes well, it could mark the big leap from continuity announcer to showbiz personality. Look out for me. I'm playing the piano at the beginning. Look, there I am now. There I look smashing. Oh, this could be it, you know. Okay. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello. Knock, knock. Ike. I do. I claim only to live to the full the contradiction of my time which may make irony the condition of truth. I'd like to start this evening by quoting the great stand-up philosopher Arnold Brown when he says, anything you do not understand this evening, please regard as significant. Because I want to talk to you tonight about this man, Arthur Craven, or possibly Arthur Craven, poet, boxer, dancer, art critic, and above all, magnificent failure. He is an obscure footnote in the history of the 20th century, about as obscure as Len Thomas. Now, when you read books, uh, Dadaism and Surrealism books about Arthur Craven, they always mention three facts. Firstly, in 1916, in an act of protest against the prissiness of modern art, he fought the then world heavyweight boxing champion, Jack Johnson. He was beaten shitless in the first round. <laughs> Secondly, in 1917, he was invited to address a group of New York intellectuals on the subject of modern art. He arrived too drunk to speak, and his lecture took the form of his removing all his clothes and urinating on a table. <laughs> Thirdly, his mysterious death in a rowing boat off the Gulf of Mexico in 1920. This, then, is the story of Arthur Craven. He was born in May 1887. Not much is known about the early period of his life, <laughs> although he is reported to have turned up in Munich, Florence, Australia, and, in an uncharacteristic gesture towards Bathos, Worthing. <laughs> By 1909, he has come to rest in the city in which he made his name. The world is limbering up for the Great War. Artists all over Europe are beginning to react against the sentimentality of romanticism. Arthur has a little flat, no money, the first pair of spotty tights ever seen in Europe. <laughs> By a scandal, failed artistry, self-publicity and violence, he is about to become the toast of all Paris. Moon River, wider than a mile, I'm crossing you in style someday. Very friend. Thank you very much, and uh, we'll be back right after this break. A little bit earlier than I'd expected. Uh, 
We thought there was going to be another ad there, a Rumbelow's ad or something like that, but uh, obviously we couldn't sell the space. Um, but it gives me a chance to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tony Hawkes, and I'm here because I'm Arthur's Huckleberry friend. Um, the thing is, what is a Huckleberry friend? Um, uh, and I've tried to listen to the lyrics to work out what this is. Moon River, wider than a mile. No real clues there, then, are there? But anyway, if a river's wider than a mile, surely it's an estuary. Anyway, I looked up the word huckleberry in the dictionary and it says huckleberry, small North American shrub related to the whortleberry. This made me feel rather insecure. I mean, did Arthur have a whortleberry friend as well? So anyway, the point is, uh, about a week ago, Arthur asked me if I'd like to take part in this show to accompany him and do some of the high notes. And then I realised what a huckleberry friend is. Because a huckleberry friend is someone who does what's asked of him, however tiring, however challenging, however emotionally draining, or however pointless it may be. <laughs> so, I'm here. Oh, right, and... you, Tony. Oh. <laughs> I hope Tony hasn't been boring you with the details of his own pathetic little life. <laughs> Number one, Arthur Craven, the boxer. Now, he was an enormous, imposing man. So big, in fact, that he became the amateur boxing champion of France without boxing. <laughs> this is probably because when he did box, he would parade around the ring before the bout started, declaring, I am a gypsy and a tramp. I am the poet with the shortest hair in the world. I am a brute. I am a brute. I am a brutey brute. <laughs> Arthur, in this sense, anticipated the only other poet boxer there has ever been, Muhammad Ali. The difference being that Ali was the better boxer, and as we shall see, the better poet. <laughs> Craven's true forte was street fighting, which he declared to be a superior art form than sculpture. René, the woman he took up with in Paris, writes, He once went to the Closerie des Lillards bar restaurant with a friend, and remarking what stupid faces everyone had, expressed his emotion by challenging and then beating up everyone in the restaurant. Guess there's no use in hanging round Guess I'll get dressed and do the town I'll find some crowded avenue But it will be empty without you I can't get used to losing you no matter Try to do, gonna live my whole life through. <laughs> Call up some girl I used to know after I heard her say hello. Couldn't think of anything to say. Since you're gone, it happens every love in you. I can't get used to. Call up some girl I used to matter what I'll find some crowded avenue I can get used to Call up some girl I used to matter what I'll find some crowded avenue I can get used to Call up some girl I used to matter what I'll find some crowded avenue Number two Arthur Craven, the art critic. In 1914, Arthur launched his magazine Maintenant, which he would sell himself from pushchairs outside art galleries. In his first article, he started with an ideological declaration. Let me say at the start that, in my opinion, the first requirement for an artist is to know how to swim. <laughs> he then ran through every artist in the gallery, starting with the legendary Marcel Duchamp. You'd think he was a fly looking at nature. And a frivolous fly at that. Not a proper fly that gets drunk on shit. <laughs> of Paul Clay. I haven't seen his contribution, but I declare without hesitation that he is a feeble idiot, since I am unable to spell his name. <laughs> of Robert de Lourney, he writes. Once more, I must admit I have not seen his paintings, but I have got drunk with him, and then, at the end of the evening, beaten him up. <laughs> of Picasso. What a prick. <laughs> During the article, he adds, for no particular reason, I should love, above all, to be debauched by a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> Overnight, Craven had become the Vinnie Jones of art criticism. 
You're just too good to be true. <coughs> Can't take my eyes off of you. You feel like heaven to touch. Oh, I want to hold you so much. At long last, love has arrived. And I thank God I'm alive. You're just too good to be true. You feel like heaven to touch. <laughs> I want to hold you so much. At long last, love has arrived. <laughs> I thank God I'm alive. You're just too good to be true. You feel like heaven to touch. I want to hold you so much. <laughs> Just too good to be true. Can't take my huckleberry friend, my huckleberry friend, my huckleberry friend, Moon River. And if you ever do that again, I'll smash your bloody face in. Three, Arthur Craven the painter. Now, unbeknownst to anyone else, Arthur was painting pictures himself. Two canvases remain. This one is entitled The Blue Silhouette. Now, as you can see, the blue silhouette in question is a stick man with no arms. <laughs> painting arms was a big, big problem for Arthur Craven. As we can see from this next canvas, entitled An Evasive Couple. Now, once again, Arthur has been unable to bring himself to paint any arms at all. But this has not prevented him giving the man hands. <laughs> Notice, by the way, in the background, the truly pathetic attempt to paint a horse. <laughs> truly CSE, grade seven. <laughs> Number four, Arthur Craven, the performer. On the eve of the declaration of war, he advertises a gig. Friday the 6th of March at 9pm. Arthur Craven will declaim, will dance, will box. Oh, for a man now who could declaim and dance and box. <coughs> um, Francis Picabia describes the gig in question. Craven appeared on stage in boxing costume and a cowboy hat. He shouted incomprehensibly at the audience, then performed the new boxing dance. The event was deemed a great success although not by the audience, who demanded their money back. <laughs> Around this time, Arthur was a regular at the Belle Boulier, a fashionable Parisian nightclub, now a pizza hut. It was here that he met the deposed heavyweight champion, Jack... <laughs> not now, not ever, never! <laughs> it was here! he met the deposed heavyweight boxing champion, Jack Johnson, of whom he wrote, Johnson is a violent man, a criminal and a tart. In short, everything I aspire to. <laughs> when the war began, Craven fled to Barcelona to avoid the draft, and here he staged a great bout with Johnson. Now, this is a picture of Craven taken uh, shortly before the fight. Now, unfortunately, we haven't managed to get his head in shot, 
but that doesn't matter because that allows us to concentrate on another of his exceptional features. His enormous testicles. <laughs> Believed to be the third largest this century after Malcolm Hardy and Jenny Agutter's father. <laughs> the fight was due to last 45 seconds. There is nothing like a dame, nothing in the world. There is nothing you can name that is anything like a dame. But the Johnson fight has provided him with enough money to book a passage to New York, where we meet Arthur Craven number five, the lover. For it is here that he meets and falls violently and jokelessly in love with the poet, fashion goddess and painter, Mina Loy. Now here she describes their first meeting. Note, she calls him by her pet name for him, Colossus. <laughs> As I arrived at the party, Colossus appeared wearing only a shirt with a toilet seat round his neck. A toilet seat? Was he, in some sense, the world's first student? <laughs> in New York, he is, of course, almost immediately deported and he sets off to Mexico from where every day he writes desperate letters to Mina Loy. Darling Mina, still you have not written and I dragged the sadness of 50 cities in my soul. Through you I have found tenderness for the first time. Flies everywhere. Come, please come. Finally, she does. And given their mutual desire, Mina's fulsome sexuality, Arthur's frustration and athleticism, who can doubt that there occurred upon her arrival in a rented room in Mexico City, the finest of the century. Mina becomes pregnant, they get married, they travel to the Mexican coast where somehow they acquire a boat. On the 1st of April 1920, Arthur takes out the boat and is never seen again. Did he drown? Did he do a runner? Did he, as he had threatened so often, fake his own suicide? Many people believe he lived on. In 1952, a very tall old man claiming to be Arthur Craven was arrested in Zurich for smashing a zither. <laughs> now, here is my theory. Arthur Craven is still alive. He's still with us. He is none other than the popular American singer, Andy Williams. <laughs> now, granted, the evidence is slim. But let's consider what it is. First, there has never been a photo of the two of them together. <laughs> Secondly, Arthur Craven was a very keen sportsman, boxer, as we've seen, and Andy excuse Williams me. turns out in charge me, of Arthur. cricket games excuse me. all Arthur. over Britain, Arthur. number seven. Arthur, Arthur, yes? can I just say something here? Yes, yes, feel free to... Small you. point. Yeah. Well, you're talking bollocks. <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, you stated clearly earlier on that Arthur Craven was born in 1887. Uh-huh. Now you're saying Arthur Craven and Andy Williams are the same person. Uh-huh. Well, that would make Andy Williams 105 years old. Yes. So what are you saying? Well, I'm saying your theory is crap. Thank you very much, Tony. Well, Tony has arrived in his lumbering, sub wartlebury fashion <laughs> at what we all know to be true. Clearly, my theory is crap. <laughs> but if Andy Williams is not Arthur Craven, then anyone who is not Andy Williams is Arthur Craven. <laughs> now... Looking around the audience here tonight, I see only one or two of you are Andy Williams. Oh, for so God's sake, sense, Arthur! The rest of you for are God's Arthur sake, Craven. Arthur, you've lost it, haven't oh, you? You've God, lost it. Go. Yeah, you make a few appearances on Wogan, and you think that gives oh, you carte yeah, blanche yeah. to come out here and listen, lecture Tony, these people Tony, on whatever listen you what's what? happening. Listen what? to this bickering. Can you what? hear what's happening? You're trying to turn us into a double act. No. That's what you're doing. No. It's obvious. Not, not. Who's there? You see? you tricked me into that. <laughs> Point is, I'm trying to establish why I've spent the last week of my life teaching you Andy Williams songs. When you can't hack it, you can't sing. My mum could sing these songs oh, better yeah, than well, you. Oh, yeah, well, get your mum to do it then. I mean, look, another thing, Tony, by the way, I meant to say to you, you know the floor manager, the bloke with the long, greasy hair rather fancies himself. Keith. <laughs> Keith. <laughs> I've asked him to be my Huckleberry friend. <laughs> and he's agreed, haven't you, Keith? Yes. There you are, you see. 
Furthermore, I've got a number of other Huckleberry friends at the moment. I've asked pretty well everyone here to be one. I've also got, I've got a Huckleberry accountant, I've got a Huckleberry dentist, a Huckleberry gynaecologist. Frankly, I'm up to here with bloody Huckleberry friends. So why don't you Huckleberry off? Go on, get on. You're wrong about me, Arthur. I'm not interested. <laughs> Many questions remain to be asked. Was Craven an alcoholic? Where do your leg muscles go when you're drunk? <laughs> what motivated Craven to live his life as art? Why does my scrotum look 80 years older than the rest of my body? <laughs> Whatever happened to white dog shit? <laughs> Was there ever an Arthur Craven's news round? <laughs> am I more or less famous than Colin Cowdery? I am a brute! I, I am a brute! I am a brutey brute! He boxes! He dances! <laughs> you fools! You buffoons! You think you're wise? You wouldn't know a wise man if he made you tea! <laughs> he declaims! A truly wise man would never leapfrog a unicorn! You, sir, what do you know of unicorns? I put it to you, you know nothing of unicorns, do you? What do you know of unicorns? What's your... You know nothing of unicorns! Tony! Tony! <laughs> Tony, of course you're my Huckleberry friend. Arthur, I don't need to be a Huckleberry friend anymore. Exactly, Tony! Now, Tony, play the piano! <laughs> you played it for her, you play it for me. Play it! May each day in the month be a good day May you make friends with each one you meet And may all of your daydreams be memories And may all your Christmases be white Tony, Tony what has this been about? About 24 minutes. <laughs>
Hello.